We are especially privileged today to have Secretary Ernest Muniz with us today. Uh, he was a Secretary of Energy under the Obama administration, and today, uh, as Secretary, he advanced the energy technology innovation, nuclear security, and strategic stability, and as well as cutting-edge capabilities for the American scientific community. Currently, the Secretary serves as co-chair and chief executive officer of the Nuclear Threat Initiative and is now the Cecil and Ida Green Professor of Physics and Engineering Systems Emeritus at MIT, as well as special advisor to the president of MIT. And we'll have a panel discussion today with the Secretary, and, 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 and who will be handling that is going to be one of our trustees, Jay Warrenklin. And Jay is the chairman and CEO of U.S. Grid Company, which provides a lower risk and lower cost transition to a secure, reliable, resilient, energy efficient, and low carbon energy and power solution. So with that, I'd like to introduce both of them now, Jay and, and Secretary Muniz. <laughs> Our technological task of making sure our microphones are turned on, but they are. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Bernard, uh, for the introduction. And um, I would just like to expand just slightly on the introduction of Ernie Moniz, um, Sec former Secretary of Energy, um, under uh, President Ob Obama. Um, under President Obama, as I think many of us know, um, he worked closely with the Secretary of State to bring to the American people the benefit of the Iran nuclear agreement. Um, and uh, prior to that, um, he had been under President Clinton, Deputy uh, Undersecretary of Energy, and was in charge of a lot of the scientific work done in the federal government um, at the time. He, interestingly enough, served at MIT um, from 1971 until he became Secretary of Energy. And he was head of the Department of Physics and also ran the Accelerator um, Center for MIT. So we're dealing with somebody who really knows his stuff on the physics side and the energy side, and, and that's very exciting. Uh, he founded the MIT Energy Initiative, which at one point grew into having over a quarter of MIT's faculty as part of that um, uh, energy initiative. He is, uh, we heard that he's CEO of the um, Nuclear Threat Initiative, which covers not only nuclear threats, but also bio threats um, and um, radiological threats of all sorts. Um, and so um, it's a great pleasure, obviously, to have Secretary Moniz with us uh, today. So in this conversation, um, I'd like to start by really focusing on the issue that I think is on most of our minds when we think about the major existential threats um, in the energy sector. And I'm thinking about global warming, and the need, as you have called it, for deep, deep carbon reduction. And one thing I, I wanted you to think with us about is, people talk about one and a half degree, not more than a one and a half degree increase centigrade um, in temperatures from pre-industrial er, um, era, or two degrees, and we start seeing people talking about degrees. I think for most of us, that's not particularly meaningful or understandable in the abstract. And I just wonder if you could put some context, number one, on the threat that global warming um, presents to us, and, um, and number two, on, and I'll ask you about some of the implications of that, th of that threat. Uh, okay, well, thanks, Jay. Um, so, first of all, we should, we should note that the, um, the uh, impacts of global warming uh, have been, it turns out, uh, rather remarkably well predicted uh, decades ago. In fact, if anything, uh, uh, erring on the side of, of underestimating some of the effects. The effects I'm talking about uh, would include, uh, and I want to phrase this carefully, for example, with some of the storms we've seen recently, the amplification 
of the impacts of tropical storms. Uh, and the reason is very simple. The water, the oceans are higher and warmer, and the air is warmer, and therefore holds more water. And this is the origin of having this amplification effect uh, when, you, when, we, when we have a hurricane, etc. The droughts, the pattern of droughts, fires, uh, movement of insects into new, new regimes, so serious modification of the ecosystems. We are already seeing these, and I want to emphasize that they were, they were predicted um, quite some time ago, the exact pattern of what we are seeing. So I think there's no doubt, and we will be seeing more and more of this uh, as uh, warming continues to, uh, to advance. Now, one, so we've already gone up just about one degree centigrade uh, from the, uh, say, 1850 kind of uh, pre-industrial times. Um, you asked about one and a half versus two. Well, there was a report by the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a grouping of scientists from, from around the world, <coughs> who did a report just about, I don't know, one to two months ago, uh, looking at what is the difference between one and a half and two degrees. So as one example, uh, uh, at one and a half, we are already seeing, as you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about coral reefs as an example. We are already seeing uh, a lot of destruction of coral reefs uh, with the, the warming and the acidification of the ocean, which is because of higher CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. At one and a half degrees, <clears throat> the expectation is that about 70% of the uh, coral reefs will be wiped out. At two degrees, 99 plus percent. So this gives you an idea in, in terms of just one observable, one the coral reefs, which of course have major roles in their marine ecosystems uh, where, where one has uh, coral reefs. Uh, oceans will continue to rise. The difference between one and a half and two degrees is probably 10 to 20 centimeters in sea level rise by the end of the century. Uh, that's actually quite a bit uh, in terms of, again, the kinds of implications it has for, for storms and the like. So basically, look, let's be, to be perfectly honest, it's going to be really hard to keep global warming to below two degrees, let's say. Uh, in this uh, century. But what I would say is there's no magic threshold, with one exception I'll come back to, there's no magic threshold. It's fight like hell for every tenth of a degree <laughs> uh, because it matters. And that, that recent report amplifying what a half degree does uh, is, is, a, is a good one to, uh, to, uh, to look at. The exception I wanted to point out where we really don't understand what might happen at some temperature rise triggering a kind of a catastrophic event that's not really in, in, the, in the calculations, like, for example, uh, with some additional warming, some melting, maybe a big chunk of the West Antarctic ice sheet falls into the ocean. That alone is close to another half a meter. Uh, if that happens. So, so prudence says we should really work hard to try to keep the, that warming as, as much under control as we can, recognizing that we are already and will have exacerbated impacts going forward. And frankly, it's going to be awfully expensive to adapt to these, to these rises. I'll give you again just one example in, okay, I'll take, take Florida. Uh, one utility, there's probably people here from Florida, one utility, Florida Power and Light, which does not cover anything like the entire state. I mean, it's got one part of the state. They've already spent $4 billion in, in adaptation. Uh, some of it is pretty straightforward stuff, but it adds up, like replacing wood poles with cement poles. Uh, uh, protecting substations from flooding, you know, of a little smart technology here and there, but that's one utility with one 
you know, kind of normal footprint, you can imagine how this adds up. If I'll just add one more, one last thing. In my own, my own hometown, Boston, the mayor has just put forward a very interesting plan, uh, a long, multi-decadal plan to completely alter the, uh, the where, where yeah, Boston, Boston's 40 plus miles of, of shore, basically. And the idea would be to build up essentially parks along the sea, which would act as barriers for increasing sea level rise, but in the meantime also provide the public with increased access to the sea. Good plan. Puts on the table a minimum of 10% of Boston's capital budget for decades. The trouble is, Where's the rest of the 90% of the funding going to come from? Gives you an idea of the scale that we're talking about here. And uh, we will have a lot of adaptation costs. So thinking about what are the actual pragmatic steps that can be taken to achieve um, a, um, a cessation of carbon emissions, for example. Um, we see that California, for example, has now passed um, um, a, um, a, law, a legal requirement that utilities not have any carbon emissions after I think it is nine, uh, 2040. Um, 45. 2045. Um, zero carbon emissions um, out of the power generation sector. I wonder if you can think with us about the practicality of legislating and then achieving a zero carbon emission result um, or whether, I think you have talked about uh, net um, zero carbon emissions, and maybe you can just describe how can we see ourselves getting to a situation where we can stop the um, consequences of global warming continuing to, um, to, to get worse. Let, let me, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, preface the answer to your question by saying that uh, two areas uh, uh, which in which we must have success to have any chance at the broader lower carbon economy is number one, uh, we need uh, to really amplify energy efficiency efforts. Uh, there's, there's demand side of the equation. And there's a lot, there's a lot happening, there, happening there in policy and in technology. Technology, I just mentioned, uh, LED lighting. It was incredibly expensive five years ago. Today, you're leaving a lot of money on the table if you don't buy LED lights. Uh, and they are incredibly efficient uh, in terms of, obviously, uh, electricity use. But the second one is the electricity generation sector does have to be at least largely decarbonized. Uh, and one reason for it is that it's a big, it's a, it's a big sector. It's about a third of emissions. Uh, but, but only a third. Um, it's a big sector. We will see more electrification of the economy. Um, electric, uh, light, light duty vehicles being electrified. Uh, heat pumps uh, for home, uh, home heating and heating and cooling, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and finally, frankly, it's the easiest sector to decarbonize. Uh, so you have the dramatic reductions in costs of solar and wind. Uh, you have the uh, dramatic reduction in costs, but not enough, uh, of storage of batteries, uh, for example, uh, which you need if you're going to have a lot of solar and wind in the system because of their variability. Um, uh, so those are essential. but. Before coming back to answering your question, I want to emphasize what we did not talk about. The rest of the transportation sector, besides light duty vehicles, let's say most extreme airplanes. I don't see you're going to see, I don't think we're going to see a, a battery powered uh, jumbo jet anytime uh, soon, frankly, ever. Uh, you can fly the solar impulse, that little plane that uh, you know, went across, uh, across the ocean, but uh, not very comfortable uh, or fast. Uh, the, um, the, tri the industrial sector, very tough. 
we need low carbon electricity, but we also need low carbon heat, high temperature process heat in the industrial sector, for example, tough, much tougher to decarbonize. Uh, we need low carbon fuels, like for those airplanes, for example. We don't have those available at any reasonable cost uh, today. So one push is, yeah, push on electricity. That's what California did. Uh, uh, at least Aspire ought to go all the way to zero by before mid-century. But at the same time, we need to innovate very aggressively to be able to manage the rest of the energy economy. As I say, industry and the like. So, uh, so it's a big, it's a big, big challenge. Now, in terms of uh, going literally to zero, uh, as the California law. So, by the way, in terms of the technologies on electricity, I should have also mentioned nuclear power. Obviously, as a major uh, low, low or no carbon source, <coughs> which we can get back to. Um, yes, we'll, but, get, we'll um, get there. Uh, but going to zero carbon if one has in the system not only intermittent uh, renewables like wind and solar but also other could be renewables like if you're if you have hydropower if you have uh, geothermal uh, if you have nuclear maybe if you have a lot of natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration, it becomes a very low carbon source, then you can design a system that is reliable uh, and resilient. If one is talking only about wind and solar and then throw in, say, batteries, uh, I am very skeptical that that would lead <coughs> to a sensibly designed economic overall electricity system. For one thing, you cannot have a system that can store, it can store electricity for only, let's say, a day. <laughs> because you are subject to the vagaries of, the, of wind and solar. Uh, and so uh, could you, in principle, have storage for weeks or months with, say, batteries? Sure, in principle. It would be in a hell of a waste of money uh, uh, to do that. So sensibly, I think you're going to have to have fuels somewhere in the system. Uh, and uh, that's not universally popular, but I think that's what the laws of physics pretty much, uh, pretty much dictate. Uh, and that's why I say, if you, if you want to say zero, please say net zero to allow for the possibility that not every individual source must be low carbon. You just need the system to be no carbon. Which includes then, as you were suggesting, the ability to um, have actual negative carbon emissions, which is, in other words, technologies that right. would permit us to actually produce less carbon, um, actually capture carbon back out of the system. And I wonder if you could just describe an example of that. Yeah, so uh, two examples, one, one which is doable today and one which is uh, not well is doable today, but not in any not in any economic sense at scale. So one is, for example, if you take uh, you know there's a fair amount of electricity produced by burning biomass. Well, if you burn biomass and then replant the biomass, then the idea is over over the appropriate time frame, it is net no carbon because then when you grow the plants back, they take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, photosynthesis. Now you could go a step further, burn the biomass, plant the biomass, and capture the CO2 when you burn the biomass. Then you are net negative carbon in the system. So that's an example that you know, we could do today if there were you know, a price on carbon or something like that. Uh, more exotic, and what is what could be viewed as kind of the ultimate uh, holy grail, would be to get the costs way, way down from where they are today, 
in terms of literally direct air capture, capturing carbon dioxide out of the air. You've got to do something with it, which we can come back to. It's a little bit of a, that's its own challenge. Uh, but literally, you know, kind of like vacuum clean the air for carbon. Uh, it's very, very expensive today. Uh, uh, you can do it, but it's very, very expensive. If you could get the cost way down and there wasn't that much more carbon left in the system, then you could imagine this becomes very attractive for one thing because you're not tied to particular plants. You know, I mean power plants or industrial plants. You could do it anywhere. The carbon is everywhere. You could go to the tundra, you know, and just keep capturing, uh, capturing carbon. So there are, uh, again, these are things that we don't have today. We're not close to being able to do it practically. But that's the kind of innovation agenda uh, that uh, we need to work on today so that maybe we have something in 30 years. Let's talk about the uh, other source of non-carbon producing um, generation, and that is nuclear. Let's just um, think f for a moment about um, the realism of adding nuclear as a component of a, a net zero carbon um, environment. Could you just describe um, where, all right, well, where we stand on uh, that? Well, first of all, today in the United States, uh, nuclear still represents nearly 20% of electricity. It's come down a little bit. Um, and it is by far the largest non-carbon source we have today. But um, some of those plants are shutting down. Uh, if you assume a 60-year lifetime for those plants, we'll have a huge wave, wave of retirements in the 2030s. That's a lot of carbon-free electricity to replace. Now, what about replacing it with nuclear? Well, uh, I, I, okay, truth in advertising, I'm on the board uh, as of March of Southern Company, which is building uh, two nuclear power plants in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, they are uh, just about a factor of two uh, over budget, um, twenty-seven billion dollars for uh, two power plants, uh, and um, and way over schedule. Uh, I remind you, I joined in March. <laughs> uh, the uh, so, frankly, uh, I do not believe we will see another large nuclear power plant, thousand megawatts or or above, built in the United States at least not for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, there's too much capital at risk and, and all kinds of issues. Uh, my optimism in nuclear power comes from a couple of sources. One is we have never, first of all, you know, the nuclear business, I mean, fission and fusion, fundamentally, you know, grew out of the war. That makes a difference. Today, in contrast, we are seeing innovation in the nuclear space that we have never seen before. There are approximately 50 companies in the United States and Canada, private funding, pursuing novel, interesting novel concepts. They are essentially all in the class, if I talk about nuclear fission, all in the class of what, what are termed small modular reactors. So rather than, you know, a thousand, twelve hundred megawatts plant, you build a plant 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts. Maybe you build a bunch of them in a cluster to make a three or five hundred megawatt plant. These technologies have very interesting technical features, which I won't go into, but they're, 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 they have, they're very, very safe, uh, which is very important. But for this audience, in particular, what I'll emphasize is the financial engineering can be much more interesting. So if you're, suppose you decide to build six 50 megawatt plants, well, you probably space them out. Guess what? You get some cash flow. 
while you're still in the construction phase versus today's reactors where you know very well, Jay, that, you know, uh, it's Southern Company, uh, this has been a many, many, many year process with all those billions of dollars tied up. Secondly, with the much less capital at risk, you can probably get much better financing terms on debt, debt financing. Third, and for me the most interesting, if you have an order, okay, I'll just name the company, I have no connection with the company, but there's a company called New Scale. I mention them because they are the ones who are the farthest along in licensing uh, at, the, at, the, at the NRC. Uh, the, uh, they have a 50 megawatt, roughly, reactor. If they had orders for, say, 10 of them, then they set up a manufacturing plant and you get all of the cost reductions, you know, learning, the cost reduction through learning, quality assurance, captive workforce, which these big plants don't enjoy. Right now, this is public. The Vogel react, the two reactors being built in Georgia, this is public. There's a shortage right now of seven to 800 craftsmen. Like, you know, electricians, pipe fitters, welders and the like. Uh, scouring the entire country and Canada to get people. You got a factory, a stable workforce, huge difference in terms of construction risk, et cetera. So I think the, the, this is a very interesting direction uh, and, um, and that could be, if there is a future of nuclear power in this country, I believe this will be it. If I may go on Please. and ask the Please. question you were undoubtedly going to ask anyway. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, it would also have, if this became a robust uh, industry again, as many of you know, I'm sure, uh, our nuclear supply chain has kind of fallen apart. And Westinghouse had bankruptcy <laughs> connected to those Georgia reactors and uh, et cetera. Um, a healthy nuclear supply chain in the United States is also actually very important for our national security. Uh, for one thing, we have set, we the United States, over many decades, have set the standard for nuclear nonproliferation agreements with other countries, principally through our bilateral uh, peaceful uses of nuclear energy agreements. They're called one, two, three agreements for those, <coughs> those in, in, the, in the know. Uh, why do countries sign one, two, three agreements with us and accept stringent nonproliferation requirements rather than going maybe somewhere else? The answer was because we had the technology they wanted. As we lose that edge to Russia, China, South Korea, Japan is still trying to stay in the game, France, our leverage for nonproliferation is going away. Uh, right now, there's a big issue. The Congress may require that Saudi Arabia, if they buy U.S. nuclear components, must have the most stringent of nonproliferation agreements, so-called the gold standard. Excuse me, forget it. Let's just go somewhere else. So, you know, let's get real about this. Secondly, we have ongoing nuclear needs for our own system. For example, uh, the nuclear navy, submarines, aircraft carriers, they need highly enriched uranium. That's known. That uranium must be enriched with an American technology. Anybody want to name where we have an American enrichment technology operating? You're all correct. Nowhere. We don't have it. Right now, we are living off of the stored 
uranium, which can last us for quite a while yet, but not forever. Another thing, and, and I'll end this, is more than you want to know, but we have to make tritium for our nuclear weapons deterrent, stockpile. Once again, you make that in a nuclear reactor, which must have fuel and reactor from the United States because of the national security issues. Again, we can't do that. So we've got to do something about the nuclear supply chain uh, uh, going forward in this country for our national security purposes as well. Sorry, it was a long answer, but. Well, thank you very much for that. You pushed my button. S <laughs> well, and I was going to ask you exactly that question, so thank you for volunteering it. Um, in addition to the Southern Company Board that you've just joined, you and several of your colleagues, um, uh, Melanie Kenderdine and, um, and Joe Heiser, have set up an organization called Energy Futures Initiative. Could you tell us a little bit about what your objective is in that and what you're doing with it? Yeah, so uh, we set up a small, <laughs> small group. Uh, we have a dozen people. Um, uh, <clears throat> where what we are, what we try to do is we are a, a nonprofit that does technically grounded analysis of energy issues relevant to the low to the low carbon future. Uh, like how, like how to uh, you know try to help <laughs> put things forward as to how how to how to get there. So we do a lot of work on the electricity system including the intersection of electricity and broadband, et cetera, with so-called smart cities. We think we, need to be, we should really be going, going about this in a different way. That's part of what we're analyzing. Uh, we are looking at um, large-scale carbon management. The things that I alluded to about capturing carbon from plants, from the air, uh, what do you do with it, uh, uh, do you really put it all underground? Uh, the scale of what you would need to do would be very upsetting to your lunch, so I won't, uh, I won't uh, go into it in detail unless you insist. Um, uh, there are also, by the way, biological uh, approaches by re-engineering plants, another uh, uncomplicated subject, uh, uh, et cetera. So th we kind of look at all those things, and our third major area is we also believe that the American innovation system in energy could, could be retweaked, uh, in particular with a stronger emphasis on regional innovation uh, approaches. Uh, I think the federal government should work with states and regions to have regionally directed programs because different parts of our country will have very different low carbon solutions uh, in, in the future. And so have them look in the areas where they can see their own low carbon future, and associated with that, energy jobs. We, uh, on our website, if, if any, anyone's interested, on our website, we published in, I think it was April, March or April, uh, a very, very large report on energy jobs in the United States, including state by state uh, uh, breakdown. And it's, uh, it's not a policy document, it's a data document in terms of what's actually happening. And, uh, and so that, that's, those are the kinds of things that we are doing with EFI. Okay. So as we bring this conversation to a close, I just wanted to read to this wonderful group here a statement that you made, which I think is a, a most remarkable and outstanding statement. <laughs> Don't deny it. It's wonderful. All right. <laughs> as, a, as a physicist, I am very optimistic that we can improve the human condition and manage major risks, you've said. And obviously, for us to elaborate on that would require another conversation of this sort of, of equal length. But I just wanted to um, ask you if you would like just to say a word about that before we, uh, we uh, suspend it. I'm, I'm so pleased. About what, the risks or the optimism? No, the optimism. <laughs> you, you've talked about major risks. We talked about the global warming risks. We've talked about uh, risks of nuclear proliferation, et cetera. Um, yet you have concluded after your years of intense engagement in all of these issues from a technical point of view and from a social point of view and from a policy leadership point of view um, that these are risks we can manage. And, um, and I wonder if you would like to um, end with that thought with an elaboration on it. Well, you've actually pretty much said it, uh, Jay. I think, I think the, uh, okay, what I, how I spend my time 
uh, it's great for cocktail party chatter, is uh, global risks, uh, cl climate change, nuclear threats, uh, where nuclear threats includes not only weapons, but also radiological, you know, dirty bombs issues, where we've made a lot of progress. Uh, and third, uh, bio risks, the issue of pandemics, which could be naturally occurring, but um, could also be engineered. Um, and um, so we're working on all three of those areas. Uh, it's a, they're, they're global efforts, not, not just the United States. Um, and, um, and I think the, the optimism is that, first of all, I do think that technology innovation will make it easier in all cases to manage then the policy, the, the more difficult policy initiatives, including bipartisan policy initiatives that we need to, uh, uh, to, to address these things. So that's one, one area. But secondly, uh, I cannot believe that we will not, in the relatively near future, uh, return to the kinds of dialogue that we need to manage many of these threats. Uh, look, I'll be honest, and this is not a political statement, political statement but I'm, one of the things in our current political life uh, that is very troubling is the way that we are growing apart from our allies uh, in uh, many of these areas. Uh, the Paris Agreement, the Iran Agreement, uh, etc. And apart from the, in the specific agreements or specific actions, the pattern of diverging so dramatically from our allies is very, very dangerous for the long term, I think, in the country um, uh, because our geopolitical strength is based upon alliances global financial institutions, trade, trade relationships, values-based system. And uh, my optimism is that I think we will return to those <laughs> and be able to address uh, some, of the, some of the big challenges we have. Ernie, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I appreciate it.